Good morning. Good morning. Um, a few things I want to bring to your attention this morning. Number one is welcome. Uh, and welcome back to some of you who've been gone for just a little bit. It's nice to see people back. Um, Grace Fellowship. Grace Fellowship has been called out to stand out. And in that, to stand out different in our society and within the churches of our community and beyond. Um, we think it's really, really important um, that in a society where men have lost their spiritual place and where boys are taught to be soft instead of strong leaders that protect, we need to be the church where the, man, the men stand strong, show leadership, give that spiritual um, head so going forward in the nursery and in our Sunday uh, children's worship, we would love to see the men involved. So um, if you're a husband-wife team that would like to serve in the nursery, we would love to have you sign up. We do need two people in the nursery now. Um, we have had up to 12 kids in that nursery and even five little boys running around is a lot for, for one person. So we would love to see a husband and wife team, but we definitely need two. Um, so even if you're a younger kid in like fifth grade or something and you're willing to play with those two, three-year-olds, we would love your help in there. Um, and there is a sign-up sheet on our serving board. Uh, May 1st marks the change of our children's church, and it goes to our spring-summer program, which means we need a completely different set of leaders. Um, the curriculum is picked, um, but summer we're flexible. So if you have something you want to do and teach and it hasn't been, um, just bring it to my office, and Pastor Lynn and I will say go for it. Um, but we would love to see husband and wife teams um, or whoever um, for our children's church through the summer. And that does involve like 18 Sundays. That's quite a few Sundays. And these kids really enjoy their children's church. So we would love to continue that year round. And again, not just be like our traditional church and have it in the winter time. So um, another small thing we've started is our coffee when you come in. Uh, it's wonderful for people to see another smiling face. So if you'd be willing to serve coffee, you don't even have to make it. Isn't that awesome? All you have to do is serve it. So um, that's on Sunday morning. That sign-up sheet is not up there yet, but we'll get it signed up. So that's kind of my um, list going forward of some really important needs that we really have to stay on top of as we're growing and changing and doing our part in being called out and standing out. So, and with that, we got a video that we'd like you to watch. At our church, Jesus is Lord. That single belief calls us together as a community and sends us into our world with hope and purpose. At our church, your past will never define your future. There's always redemption, which means there's always a brighter day. At our church, we don't think we're better than any other church out there. We're just doing our best to become our best. At our church, we want you to believe in God, but we also want you to know that God believes in you. We are not against people who don't attend church anywhere. Instead, we pursue them with love, the very same love that's pursuing us. At our church, we're learning to serve God with all our hearts and we're learning to worship Him with all our lives. And if you're looking for the perfect church, we're not it. At our church, we will make mistakes, but we will choose to grow from them. At our church, we're part of a global community that's knit together by the resurrection of Jesus. And by the way, at our church, we believe that really happened too. At our church, we will engage with people who are in real need because we are the hands and the feet of Christ. And finally, we need you to hear this loud and clear. At our church, it's not really our church at all, it's His, and we live and move and breathe in His church for His glory and His fame, not ours. 
So here's the invitation. You're invited to jump in with your whole heart at your own pace and to experience the life that awaits you in Christ. Friends, this is going to be good. Welcome to our church. Good morning. Do we have any other announcements uh, before we continue with worship? We're going to get this thing going and we're not going to stop. No other announcements this morning? All right. Well, God is good. All the time. All the time. All right, let's sing to God, I surrender all. Jesus, I surrender, take me safe. 
Amen. We come here and we do surrender all to Jesus, and we pray every day that, that the Lord hears us and helps us to give all to him. Our next song, there's a peace I've come to know, though my heart and flesh may fail, I will rise.
Amen.
that your spirit would be in his words. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for, for this house, for your house, and all that you bring to us today and the days to come. Lord, we pray this prayer as we pray the prayer that you taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. All right. Children, we practiced last week. Let's see how we do this week. We do have our our giving fish bowl up front, so if the kids can come to the middle aisle and funnel up through, and if you have anything you want to put in the bowl, you can do that, and then you can head to Children's Church. I'm going to make you stand up again. Let's stand up and greet the person next to you and say, more than enough. More than enough. Good morning. Some of you do really good with instructions, and I, I appreciate that. Uh, first service this morning, everybody was having a good time with that, and one guy sought me out and came up to me, and he says, I've had enough. I was like, what would you miss there? Anyway, good to be here, good to see you this morning. We're going to talk about the second sermon in the series I titled The Space Between, and today, Restoration, the space between unrestored and being restored. And we're going to learn that our God is a big God. He's more than enough. That space between that death on the cross was more than enough. He came out of the tomb. He conquered sin, death, hell, and the grave. Death, hell, and the grave. He stood on this earth and he said, I am Jesus the Christ, the Son of the living God. I told you I was going to come. I told you I was going to do this. And I did it. I did it. Those who confess to believe in me have more than enough. So today, we're going to talk about why are you living in a condition where you feel like you have not enough? Why do you live in a condition where you feel like you've been taken from? You're in an unrestored state. You're probably maybe a little bitter. You may be angry. Uh, you may be frustrated because you feel like this world is taken from you. You feel as though God is not more than enough. If God was God, why did this happen to me? If he was the God who you say and preach about every Sunday, how, how come I just left the funeral home and the baby died? Why is it that we go through life then feeling like God is not enough, he's not more than enough, and we frustrate ourselves? So many people live a life feeling like the world is taking from them. And guess what? The world does. The world will always take everything you have. The world will always make you feel like you're being stolen from, you're being beat up, you're being hurt by the world. But God says, I am more than enough to replace those hurt feelings. And here's what's ironic, is humankind, mankind, knows how we function. 
And he knows that if you've been hurt, and if I give you a set of rules on how to work your way back, you're going to feel good about yourself. The world will always make you feel like, if I do this, then I'm restored. If I give money to the church, God likes me. If I attend worship, I'm in God's good grace. If I serve the children's church, if I serve in certain ways, now God likes me. Mankind knows that you like rules, laws, and regulations. We do. In our human nature, we feel good about ourselves if we, you fill out the sentence. I feel good about myself if I do the five-step program and I accomplish it. And over the years, that's crept into the church. That's crept into the system. If I have my name on a church attendance or if I have my name in a church membership, I'm good because I did that. If I have my babies baptized, if I have my kids go through the faith journey class, I, I did this. We accomplished this. And I know as a body that we, we fight against the, the old traditions going forward with who we are, as I just explained to you. Because man likes to know that he has accomplished something. I'm here to tell you today, it's not about what you accomplish. It's not about what you can do at all. Even though you feel like the world has taken from you, and it has. But you can't get into right standing with God on your own. You can't get there by doing and by being. You can only get there by the blood of Jesus. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Sadly to say, churches are huge in this category. If you attend, if you give, if you worship, all the ifs, and if you do these things, now you're in right standing with God. The problem with that is, is then when something does happen in your life, God doesn't like me. My statement last year said I gave $12,000 to the church. Why did this happen to me? See the scenario? And that's where we live. But to be totally restored and to put this aside, church, we, we know, we understand that if we continue to live on Mount Zion where the law was given and the set of rules was given because they disobeyed, we know that through the blood of Jesus we've been redeemed, that we've moved the worship and the fellowship to Mount Zion. We're no longer on Mount Sinai. We're on Mount Zion and we live under grace. Grace fellowship. Hallelujah. God wants to overpay. God wants you to understand that today, that he's paid you more than enough. It's biblical. The, the Old Testament is a type and shadow of the things to come. Don't ever forget that. Don't ever forget that. Everything that happens in the Old Testament just simply moves to the New Testament. Now the New Testament explains it. But the Old Testament points forward to the cross, and now we're pointing back to what we have. When I say that God wants to restore more than enough, Leviticus chapter 6, verse number 4 through 6, is the trespass offering. Adam and Eve trespassed in the garden, okay? Type and shadow of the things to come. Adam and Eve made a grievous error. They gave the dominion and the power over to the enemy. God comes on the scene in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, and he says, listen, we got a problem. You guys made, made a big mistake. Adam, who did this? Well, it was my wife. Blame game started right in the beginning when there was only two people on earth. Gals, don't ever feel bad that your, wife bl that your husband blames you because it started with Adam and Eve. Okay? God says, who did this? He said, she made me do it. Eve, who did this? She says, the devil made me do it. And the blame game happened. And God says, okay, listen, I'm going to make it right. And I, I'm going to make it right through me and my boy. And he said, there's going to be a seed come from a woman that's going to crush the head of Satan, and he's going to be destroyed, and we're going to get this thing fixed. There's the first relationship between the father and the son. God says, me and my boy are going to fix us. The seed. Who did the trespass? Adam and Eve. Who fixed it? God the father. Through his seed, through his boy. So the trespass happened, the offense happened, and I want you to get that trespass happened. 
And look at the trespass offering. If he has sinned and has realized his guilt and will restore what he took by robbery or what he got by oppression or the deposit that was committed to him or the lost thing that he found. Do you ever find something and you didn't return it? And everybody said or anything about which he has sworn falsely, he shall restore it in full and shall add a fifth to it. This is the trespass offering. So God's saying is whatever you steal, when, when you get right with the priest and you bring the, the proper sacrifice, you've got to repay 20%. And give it to him to whom it belongs on the day he realizes his guilt. And he shall bring to the priest, as his compensation to the Lord, a ram without blemish out of the flock, or its equivalent, for a guilt offering. Now, who fulfilled our trespass offering? Jesus. Jesus was the ram without blemish. Here it is, type and shadow of things to come. Jesus was the ram without blemish out of the flock, and he fulfilled what was taken from us even though he didn't do it. Look at Psalm 69, verse 4. David's writing the psalm, but it's a prophetic verse. And in it, we see Jesus Christ. First, before we go there, 2 Corinthians 5, 21. He who knew no sin became sin so that we might become the righteousness of God. Jesus didn't do anything to deserve what he got, but God made him that offering so that we could become the righteousness of God. This is the trespass offering that was innocent of what had happened, but he gave his life freely. Psalm 69, verse 4. David is speaking prophetically. More in number than the hairs of my head and those who hate me without cause, mighty are those who would destroy me. This is prophetic. He's talking about Jesus. Mighty are those who would destroy me. Who wanted to kill Jesus? Just about everybody. Except for the few that he healed, and they didn't even show up, and the disciples didn't show up at his death. Mighty are those who would destroy me, those who attack me with lies. What I did not steal must I now restore? That's in the Old Testament. David's pointing forward, and he says, this is about Jesus, and he, he didn't steal it, yet he's going to restore it. John touches on this in chapter 15, verse 25. But the word that's written in their law must be fulfilled. They hated me without a cause. If you've got a cross-reference Bible, uh, in, in, in the center of your Bible is your cross-reference. Any, anybody know what I'm talking about? You got one of those? Those are really cool because you can go to Psalm 69, verse 4, see where it's cross-referenced in the New Testament, and this is where it goes. Meaning that Jesus Christ was the innocent one who fulfilled what he didn't do. By the way, just a sidebar, that cross-reference in your Bible, Martin Luther memorized that in his Bible. Think of that. He knew every verse that was cross-referenced without looking at the cross-reference. That's a mind from God. Jesus, what I'm getting at is Jesus is the trespass offering that was given for us without sin. He, he never did anything to deserve being the offering, but he took it for our place. So in other words, the cross is the love of God making payment to the justice of God and the righteousness of God, and we receive the much more. We're simply the beneficiaries of what happened here. Let's just give you a picture of the depth of this. Genesis chapter 15, we have what we know as the Abrahamic covenant. And I want you to understand covenant this morning because you're going to hear a lot of teaching on it in the next few weeks at Grace and the importance of it. Because something happens here in this trespass offering and in this covenant that you need to understand on how fully you are restored. And he brought him outside and said, God and Abram are having a conversation. Look toward heaven and number the stars. 
If you are able to number them, then he said to them, said to him, so shall your offspring be. And he believed the Lord. All right, just pause. God makes a promise to you. He says, go outside, count the stars in heaven. That's how many kids you're going to have. And he believed him. Could you do that? I mean, that's, and it's counted to him as righteousness later because of his faith. But wow, God, okay, I can't even count the stars. She doesn't even have a kid yet. They're getting old in age. And God says, this is how many kids you're going to have. And he believed the Lord. And he counted it to him as righteousness. That's faith. And he said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out from Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to possess. Everybody wants to be from Ur. How would you like to be from there? Ur. But he said, O Lord God, how am I to know that I shall possess it? He said to him, Bring me a heifer three years old, a female goat three years old, a ram three years old, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. And he brought him all these, cut them in half, and laid each half over against the other, but he did not cut the birds in half. And when the birds of prey came down on the carcass, Abram drove them away. And as the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell on Abram, and behold, dreadful and great darkness fell upon him. And then the Lord said to Abram, he's, he's sleeping, he's in a dreadful deep sleep, and here's what God does. Know for certain that your offspring will be sojourners in a land that is not theirs and will be servants there, and they will be afflicted for 400 years, children of Israel and Egypt. But I will bring judgment on the nation that they serve. How many of you watch the Ten Commandments? And, the, and they're getting them to let go, and the Pharaoh and Moses, there's the judgment. Do we believe the Bible to be the truth? Yeah. yeah. Isn't it cool when we read it and you start to understand it? It's all there. This was there in the Abrahamic covenant. God says, I'll bring judgment on the nation they serve. And afterwards, they shall come out with great possessions. When the children of Israel left Egypt, what'd they have? They took all the gold of Egypt with them. God gave it to them and said, here, now go. There it is, verse 14. As for you, Abram, as for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace. And now he gives him a picture of his death. You shall go to your fathers in peace, and you shall be buried in a good old age. Hmm. Thank you, God. Now, I'm, now I know how I'm going to die. 16. And they shall come back here in the fourth generation, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. Man, there's, there's, a, there's a sermon series right there. The Amorites are where the giants are coming from, and this is the evil influence that's been infiltrating God's economy, and he's trying to push them back and use people. And So this thing isn't yet complete, but I'm going to use the children of Israel. When the sun had gone down and it was dark, behold, a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch passed between the pieces. God's talking. Animals are cut in half. Abram's sleeping, and now this flaming torch fire pot passes between the pieces. And on that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, To your offspring I give this land from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates, the land of the Kenites, the Kenziites, the Catamonites, the Hittites, the Pezites, the Raphaim, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Gershites, and the Jebusites. Don't ask me to read that again. <laughs> this is where they go into the land flowing with milk and honey. All the ites are the enemy. All the ites are evil. And God says, you're going to go in and you're going to take this over only after this covenant happens. Now here's what's so cool about the covenant. Seth, come on up. Let's say there's a, there's a little bit of a slope right here. You cut the animals in half, and they're laying out here on each side. 
the reason for the slope was so that the blood would run towards the center. All the animals are cut in half. Turn the other way. Back to me. So in the beginning, when they cut the animals in half, they're both standing in the commingled blood. Both of them, you just walk in a circle that way, and I would go this way. They walk around the halves, signifying, go back to the center, just come right to the center. And then when I come back here, we are now facing each other. So we started out like this, we walk opposite circles, and now we're facing each other. Both of us are standing in the commingled blood. And this is how God made covenant with Abram. Thank you. They walked through the blood, they walked around it, and now they're facing each other. Basically, what a covenant says is that we are commingled in the blood, we've become one in the blood, and if I break the covenant, what happened to these animals has to happen to me. That's intense. Both parties agree. If anything happens between us in this covenant, what we're agreeing to is that we will get cut in half. Let me be killed and destroyed because I broke the covenant. The other thing that is very, very cool in a covenant relationship is when you started here opposing each other and you walk around and now you're in total agreement and now you're facing each other, literally everything that I have is yours and everything that you have is mine, including debt and assets. God is saying to Abraham, everything that I have is yours. When we enter into the covenant with Jesus Christ, he's saying everything that Jesus has is yours. What do we bring to the table? Nothing but a liability. And yet Jesus brings the asset and he says it's freely given. But what is this all about with this flaming fire pot and torch? Abraham's in the covenant, God's making it, animals are cut in half. It's taken a few hours here, Lord. I thought you'd kind of show up here by now. And the vultures start to come, so he's shooing the vultures away. The vultures are a picture of the world coming in to get at it. And Abraham thinks he's got to take charge and shoo the animals away. And God says, listen, no, 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 no. And he puts Abraham to sleep. Who comes in place of Abraham? A fiery pot burning cuts the covenant in place of Abraham. Who's that a picture of? Jesus the Christ. Jesus shows up and takes the place of Abraham because Abraham still has in his head, I can do this, I got to shear the birds away, I got to be in control, and God says, no, 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 buddy, listen, you just go to sleep here, we're going to take care of this, and Jesus shows up and goes through the covenant and takes the place of of Abraham. That's the restoration of the much more. God did for Abraham what he couldn't do. God does for you what you can't do. How many of you have had something stolen from you? Maybe it's a life that was taken too soon. Maybe it was a literal, physical something stolen. Maybe it was a job that you should have never lost. Maybe it was a spouse that walked out on you. We all live through these things, and yet God said to Abraham, I, I know your struggle there, but listen, I'm going to take care of this, and I'm going to let my son Jesus, because who was the covenant made in the garden? God the Father and his boy. He said the seed's going to take care of it. We can't do it, but Jesus steps in and takes care of it for us. Isn't that cool? And he promises this thing, and he says, if something happens in this, I, God, deserve to be cut in half and die, just like these animals. And you know why he put Abraham to sleep? Because we would never complete that covenant. We would not do it. We could not do it. But Jesus can, and Jesus 
did. He was the ram without spot, blemish, or wrinkle. Abraham, go to sleep. Pillar of fire's coming through. And I'll take care of what you couldn't, and guess what? You get to receive the benefits. That's our Jesus. That's how far he restored. But not only does he restore, where did we start out? He restores at 120%. He gives us more than enough. Grace is always more than what you contain or what you can handle. He says, I'm not a God who just gives you, yeah, that's good enough. You're good to go? No, I'm going to give you more than what was taken from you. 20%, that's just a figure. And yet we go through life thinking, uh, I don't know where God's at. I don't know what he's doing. And the devil will always want to keep you down. He'll always want to keep you in an unrestored state. And Paul touches on this in the New Testament. And he says, where sin abounds, grace abounds all the more. And some people say, well, you know what? If you start preaching that, Pastor, people are just going to go sin all the more if, if you do what you're saying is going on here. That gives us all a license to sin. No, no, no. Because when you understand who God is, where sin abounds, grace abounds all the more. So when I make the grievous mistake, and I do sin, we all do, and when I make that mistake, and you understand covenant, that's when you go to God in prayer, and you say, I messed up. And God says, I didn't. Yeah, but I made the mistake. I'm the one feeling hurt. God said, it's okay. Who cut the covenant? You couldn't handle it. My boy Jesus took care of it. And I'm not going back on it. So where sin abounds, grace abounds all that much more. Long fellow or light long, I don't remember his name, hundred years ago, said if pastors are not hearing that where sin abounds, grace abounds all the more, they're not preaching grace. Paul was under the gun in Rome when he preached this, when he taught this. He must have been teaching grace, grace, because they were hammering on him for saying, yeah, but where sin abounds, grace abounds all the more. That's a beautiful picture that the more you realize how big God is, the less you will sin. Amen? I told you my cookie story two weeks ago. <laughs> Fifth grade, Germantown, Iowa. We figured out you could make lethal guns out of big pens. They were cool little devices. You know, farm boys carry a plier to school. We could get one in the pocket. So you go downstairs, you take a, a, a coat hanger, and you take your plier and bite off a piece of the coat hanger, throw the rest in the garbage, and you just have a nice long piece about six inches long and then bend it so you got a handle. And you could take a Bic ink pen, I should have had one up here, and uh, pull the cartridge out. And remember the Bic ink pens had the little hole in the side? Some of you remember those? So you pull the cartridge out, you make your first spit wad nice and juicy, and then you take your clothes hanger and you pound that down there in the bottom. Then you take your next spit wad and you just put it into the back end and at the appropriate time then you put your thumb over the hole and you got this little gun and you take your bent clothes hammer, clothes hanger, and you push it through and it just compresses the air. Got a little gun, you can shoot the girls. <laughs> then you had to reload. It's all while you're in English class. Well, I got caught. A whole bunch of us got caught. So we had to take a piece of paper, I will not shoot spit wads. hundred times on a piece of paper. Did that make me stop shooting spit wads? Not at all. The more I wrote, I will not shoot spit wads, the more I've tried to figure out how to make it better. <laughs> Few months go by, same thing still going on. This time she was not happy. This time we go to the principal's office. And this time the principal takes my nice little Bic compressed air gun and breaks it in half. <gasps> Throws it in the garbage and he says, here's your punishment. You're going to eat three sheets of paper. <laughs> I had to eat three sheets of paper in front of him. He says, if you like chewing on paper so well, eat this. I wouldn't get by with that today probably. <laughs> Did that make me stop sinning all the more? The more I ate the paper, the more I was like, Arr. 
right? And I just wonder what the outcome would have been if they would have said, hey, listen, you guys, we love you. We really do. And we want the best for you. This is a good school. We've got a good education here. And we love you so much that we're going to ask you to stop doing that. What if that changed the outcome? That's where sin abounds, grace abounds all the more. Instead of using the detriment of the actual penalty to stop, it only made it worse. Did we stop? No. We got more secretive. We did it at recess. Then there was even a bigger pit, pen. You could use bigger spit ones. Corey's looking at me, don't come to school. <laughs> My point being, where grace abounds, sin is minimized. There's so many people today, though, that live in an economy that when sin happens... The church is guilty of this and many other people. What did you do? Hmm. Just take him to the verse where the guy was born blind and the disciples said, Jesus, who sinned, the man or the parents? And he says, neither. Or the minute something happens in our life, why am I being punished? How come I have to go through this? Where sin abounds, grace abounds all the more. The flaming torch, the fire pot, passed through on our behalf, and he wants to restore you at 120%. And Paul even says in Romans chapter 7, why do I do the things I don't want to do, and why don't I do the things I should do? But then when you get to chapter 8, he says, therefore there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And chapter 8 just hammers away at what I'm talking about today. He says, I'm not condemned. My Jesus stands in the presence of the Father so that I become his righteousness, so that I can be made right. Jesus is your trespass offering. Jesus passed through and took your place. Jesus is the one who accomplished it. And here's what's really crazy about this whole story with Abram. And I firmly believe that when God came on the scene and he gives the promise that they're going to have a child, she's a hundred years old when that happens. He's 100 years old when that happens. I taught this to the, the faith journey class this year, and I said, why, why was this such a big deal? Why was this such a great miracle? It's because his factory was shut down, her factory was shut down, and there was nothing going on, there was nothing happening. God fired up his factory, and he fired up her factory, and they came together at an old age, and she got pregnant. I said, that's a big deal. And it must have been that God restored her youthfulness. And I really believe that he took a hundred-year-old lady and made her look like she was 16. And <laughs> here's the reason for that, is because when they're traveling two times, Abraham, Abraham then at that point lies about his wife. And he says, oh, she's just my sister. Go ahead and take her. She's not my wife. I mean, come on. He's the guy who God made the covenant with. And he's lying about his wife. And here's what really gets crazy. The second time it happens with King Abimelech, God comes to him in a dream and he says, listen, that woman that you got into the, the king's court here, that's Abraham's wife. And he's like, what? The dude lied to me. So God tells Abimelech what happened, and then he tells Abimelech that Abraham is a prophet. God builds him up. Why didn't God reprimand him? Where sin abound, grace abound all the more. He didn't even reprimand Abraham. Why? It's because of that covenant. Because he cut covenant with him. And if you break that covenant, the same thing's going to happen to me. But for our case, Jesus is the one who took the place. Peter Peter denied Jesus with his mouth three times the night before in which he was betrayed, which before he was crucified, Peter betrayed him, goes off and is all upset and sad and goes back to what he thought he knew how to do. He went back to fishing, couldn't catch any fish. Jesus shows up on the shore to fry a few fish for breakfast. John says, hey, that's of the Lord. He says, put your net on the right side of the boat, and he gets a net-busting boat sinking load of fish. 
And Peter's reinstated, and he says, go feed my sheep, take care of my flock. Yes, Lord. And he's reinstated, and he preaches a sermon on Pentecost, and 3,000 people are saved. He never once condemned him, reprimanded him, but he reinstated him. Where sin abound, grace abound all the more. You're starting to see that picture? Yes, we need to repent of our sin. We need to ask for forgiveness. But the minute you do, that's when the grace and the covenant cutting Jesus stands there and he says, I've taken care of this. That's who I am. God the Father, Jesus, you. When God the Father looks at you, he sees you through the blood of Jesus. And he says, you have been redeemed. You have been restored. 120%. I think our God is pretty special. And yet we have the tendency to minimize God, to cut him short. Where are you, God? Why? We have a tendency to do all that. You know what? And God in his love and his mercy says, where sin abounds, grace abounds all the more. I got you. I got you covered. I had even forgot about my last illustration for you until I was working through this, I went to special reading class. Now, some of you may have known him from Polina, Mr. Barron's. I don't know if, if he came to Hartley to teach special uh, reading, but I stuttered. I stuttered pretty bad, actually. And I had problems with C's and S's. It was the lard light that was in the middle of the yard. The lard light and the chicken. Yeah, the, the C's didn't roll off right, and, and, and I, I did, I did, did st stutter. And I remember going to those special classes with him. There was only three of us, and you, you felt, eh. you know, during recess, you had to go downstairs in this little room, and he was a very gracious guy, and he taught us separately how to read, how to speak. And who would ever think that by freshman English, when I got to freshman English, and Germantown, a wonderful little Missouri Synod school there, loved it, didn't teach phonics in the late 60s when I went through there. So I, I was taught word association. Any of those, anybody remember the word association thing that didn't work? So you were, you were taught to look at the word and to know the word and to memorize it instead of your vowels. So I get to freshman English. I didn't know what a vowel was. None of my classmates did, but they picked it up faster than I did. So freshman English, I'm failing. I'm doing horrible. And she takes me aside and taught me. She taught me my vowels. She taught me my phonics. And she's the one that said in speech class, you're going to be a speaker someday. I went from stuttering to calling the chickens in the lard light to speech class, never knowing what would happen here. That's our God. So whatever you're feeling like he's taken from you or you're not qualified to do, or I, I can't, no, our God is so much bigger and he wants to restore you 120%. He wants to give you more than enough than what you can ever contain and we have a tendency to look at the bank account. We look at the farmland. We look at the cars in the garage. We look at all these things in life. God says, no, 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 no. I, I saved you and I put eternal life into you. I've got more than enough for you today. Look beyond all this stuff. I healed you from the cancers. I walked with you. I never left your side. I'm always one with you. That's how big our God is. So what's been taken from you? What, what, what's been taken from you? We all have it. We all have it in there. We all have something in our life. And I, I'd stand before you today understanding the covenant maker, understanding that Jesus was the flaming torch. He took it on our behalf, and he wants to restore you today 120% plus. That's who he is. Stop listening to the ways of the world. Stop listening to all the economic ways. But listen and embrace a loving God who says, I made covenant with you, and I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. I have restored you. I call you my own. You are my righteousness. And nevertheless, I'm yours. And I got your back. 
And I'm one with you because we did this thing. The restoration is complete. No matter where you've been, what you've done, what it looks like, the restoration is complete. Embrace that today. Embrace it. And know it. That's our God. Amen. Father, we thank you for the more than enough. Father, we ask for forgiveness today that there are so many times when we depend on our own strength. And we depend on what we can do and how we can accomplish and how we can overcome. And when we stand in that place, we're shooing away the birds and we're trying to do it ourselves and the grace and the mercy can't flow. But when we enter into the rest so that you can work, then there's a restoration. So, Father, move through the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives and the people that are here and those who are listening. All of us have gotten caught in that busyness. All of us have gotten caught trying to shoo away the birds, modeling that we've, we've got something to do here, and all you're asking is to rest in my presence and receive what I have for you. Thank you, Jesus. Father, I pray for every person sitting here today that in that losing process and in that feeling like we got stolen from and the hurt is deep and the pain is real, but in the midst of that, you still ask us to enter into that rest and to see Jesus afresh. That we can leave here with our feet not touching the ground, empowered by the Holy Spirit, saying, my God is more than enough. I have been redeemed. I have been restored. And we say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you for healing us. Thank you for the presence of your Holy Spirit. Thank you for being in this fellowship and in this, in this place where we come together to worship you. And we praise you. Thank you. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Amen? Let's stand. I could just have a quick prayer. Lord, as we begin the school week, may our students use ink pens appropriately. I pray this with all deep sincerity, with everything in my heart. Amen. All right, let's worship God. <coughs> All right, this uh, song can be found in your uh, Faith We Sing books. From what I've been told, uh, we've done this many times in this church, so I want to hear you sing loud and proud. Praise. 
sun rises upon our days, shines upon our heads, as the sun sets and provides our souls of rest. May we walk this earth knowing that our life is in you, that we have strength in you, that we have hope in you. Lord, thank you for your sacrifice, knowing that as we leave here, we are free people. We are forgiven people. May you all go in peace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <laughs>